And so here's his past history. He's had hypertension, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which was a biggie for him um, maybe many years ago. And that he did fine, but he wound up with chronic lymphocytic leukemia later and goes to the NIH once a year for evaluation and treatment. Apparently no treatment and has been doing well. He also has the history, new history of GERD from the ER temp general, kidney stones, a little diverticulosis, previous tonsillectomy, spinal surgical removal of lumbar spine lymphoma tumors followed by extensive radiation. He did not have proton beam therapy, which we do nowadays for spine lymphoma. Uh, he did have a, sort of a large mantle exposure, uh, extensive radiation. His history is from hypertension in the family, coronary disease in the family. He's a non-smoker. His medications, uh, basically uh, aspirin and chlorodiazepoxide and a few other things like olive leaf and red marine algae. And uh, prior medications when he had chemotherapy for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you can see he had the deadly adriamycin doxorubicin, which we always look at the heart and think about that because of cardiotoxicity. He had vincristin, looks like some variation of CHOP there with cyclophosphamid. Vincristin is oncovin which is a periwinkle alkaloid, and prednisone and procarbazine. So those are his medications, and that's his story. Physical examination, really nothing really turned up on physical examination. And so the question is, how do we evaluate this guy? Here's a guy who's got a negative spec scan, had some chest pain after a huge meal, and then went to bed with it with a huge meal and woke up. Had some GERD, a lot of burping, and uh, here he is now seeing a cardiologist. He advises to see a cardiologist and follow up. Uh, Pooh, would you like to take this one a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, we'll start off with the EKG just to make sure, um, unless we have the records of the EKG from there. Uh, Echo, if uh, he had one there, if we can just see the pictures or get another one. He had a physiological test, CCTA, so if our suspicion is high, he has a lot of risk factors like radiation, family history, I didn't see that, but if he has an anatomy test for the bad either. Okay, Pooh, there's your EKG. Uh, let's see, it's sinus, uh, left axis deviation, R wave transitions kind of it's like a late transition, so that makes me think that he had some anterior infarct of some sort. Negative spec skin, um, negative spec skin. But that's, what if it's multi-vessel? Um, RV progression is poor, but yeah, that's about it. Sinus, left axis, and poor RV. Looks like a little prolongation of his QRS. Looks like a little bit of a terminal conduction delay. So maybe an incomplete right bundle, because there certainly is a terminal conduction delay. A little prolongation, but of course he's got, he's tending towards left axis over here, maybe rotating around towards the left anterior fascicular block in the future. So gradually you lose a few fibers and the axis rotates around. And here's your echocardiogram. I'm sorry we don't have the actual images, but uh, here's the story, 55% ejection fraction. So there's no the anterior wall in my Poor R wave progression is very common, especially as you move towards the left axis. And most people with left anterior fascicular block all have poor R wave progression. And so his axis was like minus 30, so he was moving in that direction of poor R wave progression. If you actually move the leads down in inner space, you can see better R wave. And so he's got some bicuspid aortic valve with moderate regurgitation, no significant uh, aortic dilatation, no LVH. Even though Tampa General Echo, they said LVH, there's no LVH. That's a very sensitive marker in terms of technician driven. And so frequently, see, it's just a millimeter or two and you got LVH. So you got to be very careful when you do those echoes. And then he's got atherosclerosis. I mean, he's got non calcified carotid plaques bilaterally. So that, by definition, is atherosclerosis. Uh, and the carotids are so easily available for us to take a look at. 
that we take a look at them all the time when somebody comes in just to evaluate them to decide if they have any silent vascular disease that nobody's discovered yet. And so, Melody, what would you do at this point, if anything? Well, his clinical situation sounded more like his gallbladder than anything, so I'd probably have him worked up for that, and then uh, potentially get him on some medical therapy for his atherosclerosis, which is asymptomatic. So we've got good news for non-invasive cardiology, and the good news is we have four wheels instead of two, and so that gives a lot of greater options and greater stability question is, most hospitals are only using two wheels, Echo and Nuke. How do we get to the four-wheel Ferrari, Echo, Nuke, CT, and MRI? Because cardiology is already there. We already have mature technology. And actually, our educational body, the ACGME, through the Cardiology, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, COCATS4, has said that CT and MRI need to permeate, permeate all the stuff we do. We've got everything, we've got to have that option all the time. We make the choice between echo, nuke, CT, and MRI. Unfortunately, most hospitals are still echo, nuke, not making that choice, but we've got to catch up, certainly with education. So this is a little sort of primer to tell you about where we are. And so it was real easy for cardiology and echocardiography because we started out with the echo encephalogram that was used for look for a midline shift when someone had a subdural hematoma and you put that on the on the head on the skull and you would look and you see a little bit of grass here in the middle and that would tell you that well it's not equidistant so it was a midline shift you could apply that to uh, the heart and so we stuck this on the mitral valve and you could look trans uh, dermally and you can see that there's a little grass moving up and down, and that would tell you this is the mitral valve, and that's about it. And then uh, in the early 70s, uh, Harvey Feigenbaum had this machine up in Indianapolis, and he was starting a book. And uh, basically, this is the echo line. And I went up there and took uh, was a two-day wander at Dr. Feigenbaum's lab with Sonia Chang. Brought one of these back, put it in my garage, brought it over to Tampa General, trained somebody, and then uh, we asked for a room and. Finally got something down the basement. They said, this will never catch on. What's Harrison up to? You know, why don't you bring this thing over here? We don't have any room for this. And so we started echocardiography. And then the radiologist said, hey, you know, we own ultrasound. What are you doing? Doing echocardiograms. But anyway, as you can see, the evolution in 40 years has been extensive to where we're at 4D echo, strain echo, which nobody seems to have yet or seem to get. But this is very important. And this is where we are today. Well, what about Nuke? Well, Bill Strauss started Nuke uh, at Hopkins and used cesium and uh, then later thallium. And we had planar imaging with this very simple device, but it incorporated the Anger camera, which is 50 years old. That evolved into PET scanning and SPEC scanning. And I basically declare that uh, SPEC scanning is a fail at this point because it's evolved into a technique that uh, is basically very sloppy. And so because of innate artifacts, that is breast tissue, stomach artifact, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan did a study. In the state of Michigan, there's 40% false positive, 65% false negative in about 40 hospitals in the state of Michigan. And so that's pretty amazing that of 100 people who don't have heart disease, we tell 40 of them that they do, of 100 people who do have heart disease, we miss, miss 65. So I call this a fail, uh, except for Dan Berman and a couple people in the big centers, you know, were able to hang on to a nuclear technologist, whereas uh, most places they just use a regular technologist that uh, does spleens and livers and uh, lungs, and uh, they body flop the patient onto the spec scan and make a quick picture, and uh, we call that technique. PET scan has really taken a different road. Unfortunately, not everybody has uh, Dr. Lance Gould's software. He spent uh, 43 years and $100 million developing this software. It's really cool. And uh, the payers deny it, even though the, the cost is only $1,367, which is the same as a spec scan, it got uh, costed down uh, by CMS. It's the same as a spec scan, 
the, the payers are still denying it and saying, oh, no, that's for people who have large bodies, um, large body mass, or uh, somebody who's left bundle, and so they declare certain indications. But So this took a long time to evolve where it is, and uh, CT, now that we're jumping on the bandwagon, is a mature technology. And uh, so basically, instead of gradually evolving and seeing this evolution and incorporating this in our daily workflow, all of a sudden we've said, oh, look, we got CT. Oh, look, we have MR. And these are superb cardiac modalities. There's an example of late gadolinium enhancement. This is an example of something called sync imaging in a single heartbeat. This is an example of heart flow, where we're able to measure using the CT the blood flow down the coronaries, a company called HeartFlow that does this called, something called the CTFFR. And so very mature technology dwelling in every hospital. But unfortunately, because we didn't have this gradual evolution, nobody knows how to use it except people who are coming out of training. And not very many are coming out as level twos because they're coming out as level two nukes, level two echo, sometimes level three echo. And uh, so we, that's why we have advanced cardiac imaging programs, but there unfortunately are only 27 programs in the country that may be cranking out one or two fellows a year. So we got a long way to go to catch up, but I want you to know that this eventually will be a four-wheel vehicle, and hopefully we'll have two new options uh, if everybody can play catch up. So as you see, traditional cardiology algorithm is the six-pack. The six-pack is history, physical, EKG, echo, spec, and cath. You sell this six-pack. If a cardiologist touches a patient, it's been shown that the system spends $7,000. That's pretty expensive uh, touch. And so his history, physical, EKG, echo. The gatekeeper is the spec scan. You can buy a rebuilt, refurbished spec scanner for $100,000, put it in your office, and it's not as lucrative as it used to be, but you still make $6,000 a day. And unfortunately, we've got these numbers. Well, 40% false positive is actually a low false positive number. And really, um, we have here at Memorial Hospital 50% false positive. We have uh, a university a hospital I know of has 80% false positive. Ottawa, nine hospitals have 88% false positive. And of course, the 65% false negative. So we're selecting the wrong patients for a cardiac cath, and that's why we have a 60% cath rate that's negative. 60% of cardiac caths are negative. And there's also poor correlation with spec scan and FFR, multivessel coronary artery disease. The sensitivity and specificity of these tests. This is a, I submit the, some sensitivity and specificity here, and you can look at that and see the superiority of MR and CT on uh, these meta analyses that we have. And so let's talk about the CT scan on this gentleman, and let's talk about why we do a CT on him. You know, well, if you've got a 40% false positive, 65% false negative, and you've given this guy reassurance that he's okay, which may be false reassurance, then, hey, we want to know what the real truth is. So let's uncover the truth because we're not using that algorithm anymore. That's just traditional, but we're non-traditional and we're advanced cardiac imaging. We want four wheels on a Ferrari than, rather than two wheels on a Ducati. So let's get our images up here. So here we are. This is our cardiac, pretty impressive looking images, aren't they? I like to trim them down a little bit. I hope he doesn't feel this. And we're going to slice this off. This is my chance to be a surgeon. And uh, you can see the precise work that I do very delicately, dissecting off some stuff below the diaphragm. And now we can rotate this around. That's pretty impressive. So if you were a Maori looking at this, you'd think I plucked out of your heart. 
You'd be very upset with that image that I'm showing you. You might go, you might punish me for that because it certainly does look like I've plucked out somebody's heart. And so you can see just looking at the 4D volume rendered image, you can see that there's a hypoplastic right coronary artery. There is some expansion of the right coronary artery here and maybe some obstruction there. But the right coronary artery really doesn't matter because it looks like the left circumflex is going to be the dominant vessel. And so it indeed, the left circumflex is coming around here giving off a posterior descending. This is a vein, so don't mistake that. And uh, this is not the, the world's best study, but it's adequate and it's a good study. And we're going to look inside these vessels in just a minute. Sometimes we actually resect some things off so we can see better. And so let's just take this part. The left atrial appendage frequently gets in the way of the main left coronary. So we like to carve that out. And so we remove that. You can see his aorta isn't dilated, although he does have somewhat bicuspid aortic valve. And now you can see a little bit better, but you'll be able to see a lot better when I come around here and take this off. There we go. Frustrated cardiac surgeon. And so there we go. Up in there is where we can see the origin of the coronaries. A little bit better. One more, one more slice on this. You've got to be bold when you take a whack at this. There we go. Yeah, I see better up there. Anyway, let's take a look inside these arteries. We have a way of, we have several ways of doing that. We can go over here and look through our axial views. We can go over here and we can trifurcate and we can look at all three of these. See the ascending aorta, see the aortic valve, see the left ventricle. Here's the aorta. Here we go with coronaries. And so let's go to where we can actually look at coronary specific images and highlight one or two coronaries at one time. And so let's get this up here and uh, see what we got in this view here. Melody, you want to take a crack at this? Uh, sorry, I'm trying to orient myself here. So we're looking at this vessel and as you've turned on the colors here, we have a couple of chunks of calcium and the yellow that we're seeing. But the lumen in green looks pretty quite large throughout the vessel. Nothing looks obstructive here that I'm seeing. Let's take a look at the LED and take a look at the main left. The main left is supposed to be as big as the circumflex plus the LED. And you can see it's not even as big as the LED. So basically there's main left narrowing, main left narrowing throughout its course. It's like a tubular narrowing of the main left. Actually, there's some dark stuff up in here. And so let's rotate this around a little bit more. And you can see some calcification somewhat distally there in the LED. And this is a really complex plaque right here where you see calcium. All this black stuff is really non-calcified plaque. There's stuff up in the side here. There's stuff up in the side here that actually is the vessel and the wall of the vessel. And so the main left is a tubular narrowing of at least 50%, maybe a little bit greater right there. And then this complex plaque at the origin of the circumflex and then a couple calcified plaques there. So this is very complicated anatomy and histology uh, of someone who's had chest pain, who has a negative spec scan. Let's go up in here and take a look at the circumflex separately. And so this is interesting because there's narrowing of the circumflex here. Here's the narrowing of the distal main left. Here's, the here's a piece of plaque right there. Here's a big piece of plaque right here. Here's calcium in that plaque. Here's more calcium and more calcium here. There ain't maybe an ulcer in this plaque. Uh, giving us a little bit of contrast penetrating into the side of it. 
And then we got a plaque down here that has some narrowing. Let's take a look at that plaque. Let's go down this way and look at this little plaque over here and see what you think about that. Let's go down and see, see if it's hard to find a normal vessel, but maybe that's normal size there. And so there is some narrowing. Depends on where you go, where the narrowing is, because it's we can't find, you can't compare to normal. Yeah. So it's hard to decide what's going on there. Nevertheless, there's something going on there of some sort. And uh, we may have dissected it out over here to look at it in more detail. And uh, let's go over here and see if we got more information. We'll restore this image from over here. It takes a minute to be, ah, there we go. So we got, it looks like we have a 46% diameter lesion in this particular vessel with a 74% cross-sectional area. And it looks like we've got the plaque that looks like this. You can see the narrowing. Look, the column of dye or the column of blood going through this is the green. And as we come through the green, the green gets narrower and narrower. And then the green comes back and gets bigger and bigger. This is called the fried green egg with ketchup. The fried green egg with ketchup is when you see a narrow lumen, you see expansion of the wall of the vessel, which is called positive remodeling. And then the ketchup is the non-fibrosis uh, liquid plaque that basically, in this case, we've labeled it as being less than 50 Hounsfield units. And the blue uh, corresponds to fibrosis. Bright yellow, probably not any of the yellow we see here, but really bright yellow corresponds to calcium. This yellow is not calcium. It looks like a halo. This yellow is actually a blending of the green and the blue to give this artificial light yellow tone which uh, is misleading. It really isn't anything. And so, Pooh, what do you think now that we've found main left coronary artery disease, 50% tubular main left, severe disease in the LAD, maybe a ramus here that is a severe lesion at its origin, circumflex has a very complex plaque at its origin, and then we've got this convergent, divergent double cone image involving uh, the circumflex at this area. What do you think about all this stuff now? And this guy who had normal scan, who had all this reassurance uh, that he was okay. It's a lot of osteal disease, like everything proximal. Um, it's in the radiation mantle radiation zone because radiation usually was proximal. And if it's multivessel CAD specs, CID sometimes we don't catch and it can falsely normalize to all walls. Like if everything's abnormal, then you'll end up getting a normal scan, right? Because all walls have less count uptake. So, so that's true. So that's true. You're you're giving uh, the uh, spec scanners an opportunity to have it, to get out of this conundrum uh, because uh, the main left coronary disease decreases blood flow down the entire circumflex and LED areas. And if it's a dominant left circulation like it is in this case, there's not going to be any difference in right coronary flow either. And so uh, because it's not going to be much right coronary flow. So then since we're not measuring absolute blood flow, we're doing relative and we're comparing one area to another area, it's all going to be homogeneous and all going to be the same. So that would be the uh, spec scanners out on this one and say, oh, you know, I'm usually right, but I'm just not right this time because of the main left disease. Of course, we know they're not right about 50% of the time, which is about the same as a coin flip. Uh, but that's okay. It's robust radiation exposure. You know, gives you maybe uh, 9 to 13 millisieverts. And, uh, you know, it pays, pays a little bit of money. So we're going to move on then. This is very interesting. Let's see what where we can go from here. We don't see any damage to this heart. I'm all real concerned about this. I'm concerned about the main left. I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about that. But most of all, I'm concerned about this guy 
uh, which I think is the worst lesion because this is fulfilling some of my criteria uh, in terms of vulnerable plaques. But let's go on and see where we go from here. So I'm going to reduce this and reduce this. And we're back to our slides again. And the overread by the radiologist, which we're glad that they do that because that's very helpful to us, uh, re reveals the bronchiectasis that we knew that the gentleman had and uh, in the right medial lung base, which has been known before. And uh, some prominent lymph nodes in the left axillary region. We know he has uh, had lymphoma. We know non-Hodgkin's. We know he has leukemia. And so all this stuff is being followed by the NIH and is known stuff. The overread is uh, difficult to decide by Medicare how to do the overread because two people can't read the same thing according to Medicare and charge for it. And so they have certain standards, and uh, they don't allow this, really. What they say you do is the cardiologist has to take a stab at it and do a read of the chest, and then a radiologist can come in and do another read, uh, the so-called overread, and then somehow get paid, even though two people can't charge for the same thing. This is very difficult. Medicare is not accommodating. Nobody knows how to adjust to these scenarios where two people are looking at the same thing, unfortunately. So now what do we do? Uh, and uh, I think Melody knows our practice better than anybody. Melody, what do you think about uh, my next step? Although it may not be conventional and nobody else in the country may do this, what's my next step? Well, based on the slide you have up here, I guess you're going to get some additional testing and look at some of these inflammatory markers and further risk stratify this patient. Yep, and you know I'm into risk markers, and you know that I've got an obscure risk marker set that nobody in the world really respects or uses, but it's been tested against the Marshfield Clinic database of Wisconsin people who a pretty homogeneous population of white guys, but it's also been tested in uh, the multi-ethnic group of the NIH, and it comes out to be very predictive of cardiac events in the future. And so nobody got the memo except me. And so we're testing this, and we like it, and we're going to come up with more information about it in the future. But uh, here we go. We've got human uh, hepatic growth factor. We got FAST ligand, which has to do with apoptosis. We got SFAS, also apoptosis. We got eotaxin, which has to do with cells migrating in. It used to be eosinophytes, but now we also know that uh, macrophages migrate in with eotaxin. We got interleukin 16, MCP3. That has to do with cells migrating in. This is uh, one of the interleukin uh, inflammatory markers. And we got CTAC, also a chemotaxin uh, type chemical of cell migration. So it sounds like a pretty interesting test. And so we did it on this gentleman, and we got 6.44 times normal. Now, I don't know how that reflects with somebody who's got leukemia. Uh, I have very little database to test on, but I call this marker positive when I see it. So I call the plaque that we saw, uh, you know, suspicious, and I call this marker positive. You can see his cholesterol, LDL is very high. You can see it could use some lipid reduction. Lipoprotein little a is high, 24. Highly sensitive C-reactive protein, a conventional, non-conventional marker is 4.4. Uh, so now where are we going to go? And Melody knows me better than anybody because she's been on her service. And Melody, where are we going here now? And you can pick several of these. Well, I'm not sure in this case. I think you definitely want to start medical therapy to reduce his risk. Uh, the lifestyle modification sounds great, and then I guess I'd have to talk with him about further studies like FFR or a heart cath. I mean, if we truly believe that the 50% left mean. Okay, that's well taken. So let's see what we did do. And so, well, we're interested in plaques and what happens to plaques. And did you know that a plaque is in transition? And it goes from necrotic core to fibro fatty to fibrous to dense calcium. So it's an equation that goes from left to right, doesn't go backwards, it only goes forwards. It's only from left to right. And statins accelerate this transition. And when you get to dense calcium, this is pretty benign stuff. You sort of neutralized what was a, a lipid rich, uh, maybe thin fibrous cap blister that had the potential of 
rupturing and repeating rupturing as it occludes a vessel to a fibro fatty, which may do some of the same things, to a fibrous, which doesn't do much of anything, might shrink a little bit, and then dense calcification, which is basically neutral, but can also penetrate through the endothelium in rare cases, maybe 9% of the time, and also is responsible for some infarcts by eroding off the top of the endothelium. And so we've got all this dynamics that's taking place. Some people are doing calcium scoring. They're just looking at this. I'm really interested in this. I don't care about if it's all burned out and if we chop down the forest or the forest is burned down. We got a few smoldering stumps. I just want to know, are there embers still? Is there more fire to come? You know, what's happening on this side? Are we inputting more necrotic core? Uh, I want to stop this process and stop right here. And sometimes that happens in some people. Some people go up and down. They have a little inflammatory. They get necrotic core again. They go through this whole thing again. Then it settles down for a couple of years. Then it starts over again. Some people it just goes right through one time and that's it. And all we see are some focal calcifications in the vessel and uh, no more. So basically, here we go on plaque characterizations. Of course, we start on medical therapy. Of course, we say, you know, change your lifestyle. Lots of luck on that one. That's the most difficult one. Get him in rehab, but he can't go to rehab because he hasn't any damage. You got to have a stent. You got to have damage. You got to have congestive heart failure. You got to have something if you're going to go to rehab. So basically, we try some prehab, but not rehab. And so here's the necrotic core. This is the bad stuff. It's sort of confluent here. It's like an interstitium. You can see how it's interlinking little pools of lip, liquid, lipid lakes. Uh, and you can see it's almost touching. Uh, the lumen over here and so and then there's a lot of fibrous stuff and then the lumen narrows and narrows more this is not calcium this little halo is just blending uh, by artifact of green and blue to make yellow more stuff this is the one we magnified because this is a very interesting one because we got all this stuff it looks like it's got a long way to go so it doesn't look like a thin fibrous cap unless we want to go back and look at this part over here. This could be a thin uh, fibrous cap, but uh, we can't measure that because it's like 65 micrometers, and a uh, thick one is 85 micrometers. So that's out of our league with CT scanning. It's even out of uh, the league of IVUS, which is the intervascular ultrasound. It's in the league of OCT. Um, and so uh, let's move on and take a low look. You can see that we have, by volume, 28% of the entire plaque that we measure, well, this is not measuring right because I have to narrow limits of that. But let's just take this one plaque right here. We've got about maybe 50% of that plaque consists of necrotic core. So it looks like a dangerous plaque to me. I'm concerned about it. We've got a, a diameter of 49%, cross-sectional area of 72%. has to be 85% diameter reduction to decrease flow, according to Dr. Lance Gould and his original studies for that. But we're interested in biomechanical and mechanical activity and uh, actually when you form your coronary vessels, there's biomechanical and biochemical activity is taking place. There's uh, stress chemicals that are, that are very active. There's a, a piezo chemical that's taking place. There's tag that's involved, all this stuff you can find in stress and strain that's inducing differentiation of cells, causing cell migration and causing the vessel to form are the same things that lead to the changes that take place when uh, we get lipid in there and macrocytic immigration and uh, foam cells and uh, apoptosis and cell death and get all this grumous stuff in there. Same thing is taking place that caused these vessels to form in the first place that's causing them to deform and form follows function. So a lot of biomechanical stress. You can see a convergent divergent double cone is in essence a rocket nozzle. And so that there's all kinds of computations we have for rocket nozzles. That's basically the Navier-Stokes equations. You can see the Bernoulli thing. You can see that basically as this pressure increases, as the velocity increases, the pressure decreases, law of conservation of energy. And so velocity gets really high here, pressure gets really low here. And so that's important because 
this is the plaque and this is the column of dye. And so the least pressure is the top here. And so we've got pressure on the side. We've got stress on the side. And so you wonder why these things pop and they pop like a blister. And that's how they keep, uh, or like a little pimple. And that's how they sort of, um, will get a little clump of platelets and then lice and they get another clump of platelets and gradually build up and become an obstruction. And these are some of the things that are happening, the eddies, vortices, microcavitation, all kinds of, this is after a jet engine takes off, you see those waves, all kinds of stuff are taking off. Sometimes microcavitation takes place where you get little bubbles and the little bubbles collapse high temperature light emission, which is actually blue light. Sometimes you can see that on a waterfall. And so this is a real active thing that happens, you know, with uh, collapse of these micro bubbles against the solid surface with little micro jets, which could be eroding against the plaque. All, this thing, all these things are entirely possible. And so this is NASA stuff for nozzles, which are convergent, divergent double cones, which that consists of with the throat. And so all this is applicable uh, meshes are applicable. Application is available actually online. I've, there's some software I have I can just apply to this that's free. And so getting back to this plaque, this is another picture of the plaque looking in a different direction. Hmm, looks juicier here. Looks like there is maybe some close contact. Can't tell about the fibrous cap, but uh, it's starting to look bad. And actually this vessel, the one I picked out, I'm less concerned about the main left. I'm less concerned about the proximal circumflex, which has a complex lesion. I'm less concerned about the LED and more concerned about this plaque this far from the origin of, the, of, of this vessel. More concerned about that plaque than anything. Did I pick the laride plaque? We'll find out in a minute. And so here's where we're applying some blood flow stuff. We're looking at the throat of the obstruction. We're looking at pressures, we're looking at eddies, we're looking at vortices, uh, we're looking at all the activity that's taking place. We're applying Bernoulli. Our friend Bernoulli is back with low pressure at the cap and high velocity. And uh, our friend axial plaque stress is much more in terms of a vector against the wall of the plaque than wall shear stress, which is very little. And so then we apply this stuff that we've learned in terms of sub-voxel resolution evaluation. And look, we're clearing the lumen out and able to identify the lumen in a side branch. And then we're making this very complex picture. And then we're applying the mesh, which you can do online. I've got a mesh thing. And then we're basically quantifying the rest of the flow per vessel and looking to see if there is left ventricular hypertrophy because that means a more of a capillary system to have to perfuse applying a lot of microvascular resistance factors, computational in terms of if you had a denison, what would happen in terms of a hyperemic challenge, and then using Navier-Stokes computational fluid dynamics to take a million equations over each little millimeter and calculate this, which is the FFR. The FFR is the fractional flow reserve that tells us how the blood flow is down the vessel. And so that's the name of the game, and here we are. Hello, Pooh, what do you think about this? So, I mean, FFR is significant, less than 0.8 in the left-sided system, both LAD and SORC. Um, so he does, I mean, he'll need a cat and standing, potentially. So uh, he would need, why would he need a cat if we've got all this data? FFR is significant, right? If he's, I guess he's asymptomatic, but still he has significant LED and stroke disease, and the plaque that you showed, what if it ruptures? So the cat's going to show basically the same thing. We've got anatomy and we've got physiology. But we could stand it, right? Um, if there's, oh, if we, the FFR is false positive, so 0 0.69, 0 0.61, so for more for like PCI purposes than a diagnostic test. Yeah, so I don't think we need a diagnostic cath because we've got anatomy and we've got physiology. But if we're going to do something therapeutically to salvage this patient, it's probably not going to be stenting uh, because usually we don't It's multi 
It's multi-vessel. Usually we don't stand main lifts, although we can, and we have. And I have a lot of elderly people that we stand at the main left in because we didn't want to do anything that was too involved in terms of surgery on elderly people. But the lima would be atrotic in these people anyway, right, who had radiation. We didn't get a look at it. But mostly people who had radiation, if there's going to be necrosis or vessels are going to be small, it's going to be unanimous. And your touchdown, like, the grafts won't last very long. So we got a problem, basically. we got somebody who's had previous radiation to their chest, extensive radiation to their chest. So it's going to be hard to get in if you're going to crack their chest. You can't get in very easily. There's going to be a lot of adhesions. And so that's problematic. So we talked about all that to this gentleman. He's asymptomatic. He had one episode of, quote, GERD, close quote, which basically occurred at rest at night after having had a heavy meal and heavy indulgence. It probably was GERD. You know, we probably did stumble across something that he has that's asymptomatic. And so basically, he wanted medical therapy. He said, "I don't want to go to surgery. I don't. That's that's a big deal, you know, with all my scar and stuff. You know, I don't want to go stenting. I don't want to go to any of that stuff." So he said, "Okay, we'll treat you medically." So that's what we all decided together. However, he does have what I call triple positive, where he's got FFR positive, marker positive. That's the plus test, and plaque characterization. And so that's a risky proposition for a rupture, but only rupture at that one site that we identified, the uh, Achilles heel, uh, which is basically down the circumflex a little bit, proximally. And so there's my three positives that uh, in terms of plaque, morphology, in terms of FFR, and in terms of uh, cardiac markers. So basically, he opted for medical therapy. And he's got aspirin, Lipitor, avoid fatty foods, exercise on a regular basis, and close follow-up. And so he did those things. He also had a workup by pulmonary, and they're treating his bronchiectasis. He also was found to have a little bit of mild sleep obstructive apnea. And he came back to see me April 1st, and uh, he was having pain from Lipitor. He was having some statin myopathy, so we switched him from Lipitor to Provostatin. When he saw me in September, the first time, he weighed 209 pounds. Now, since his lifestyle changes, uh, spitting classes, lifestyle amount of modification, dietary discretion, he weighs 209 pounds. And so you know how it is with lifestyle modification. Nothing happens unless you have a sudden cardiac event, and someone hits you on the head with a two before, you're not going to change your habits. So let's see what happened after that. Well, let's see. Here's a presentation to the emergency room. He waits four hours with substernal chest pain. Calls some friends. So I'm having chest pain. What do I do? As if, you know, he didn't see any of the stuff we showed him. So it shows you how strong denial is extremely strong. He weighs 209 pounds still, and uh, basically he gets chest pain, and he's waited four hours calling around to his friends. He's out of town, and so finally he shows up at an emergency room in one of the hospitals in Raleigh, and luckily they got some good doctors there. Here's his EKG. What do you think about his EKG now? Sinus, V3, V4, antrolateral territory has um, ST segment changes which are concerning. There's again leftward axis. So that's uh, pretty in a nutshell. It really doesn't show you a lot, uh, but he was having severe pain. This doesn't tell you a lot. There are some changes. He's uh, still, he's got different R wave progression there. I don't know why that is. His axis isn't as leftward as it was. Uh, he's got some ST and T wave changes, but it certainly doesn't reflect what we found in the cath lab which is here. So this is his cardiac cath. We're in the right coronary. And this is his proximal right coronary disease, but the right coronary is a small vessel. doesn't have a lot to it. And look, it's filling septal perforators or something. Yeah, it looks like some septal perforators are filling up there, okay, because of his coronary disease. But let's go on and look at some of the other images. And uh, 
the images that uh, knock your socks off is this image here. And so there's exactly where we said his vulnerable soft spot was. His soft spot, his Achilles heel, is right there in the circumflex. It's a parrot beak deformity, which means he's got a sudden occlusion of this vessel. You can see where the convergence was. The divergence is down here. We can't see that. But you can see the convergence, and there's the parrot beak. And so that's swollen. That's got obstruction. It's got a clot in it. And so the main left doesn't look any different. The LED doesn't look any different. And so the problem is to open this vessel up and see if we can uh, basically save this guy's life. He's still got the main left disease. He's still got the proximal circumflex disease. You can see right there, he's still got disease involving the LAD. And uh, he's got some spasm on the main left as well. That was relieved in nitro. He got in such trouble, he's on an epinephrine drip. He's got an aortic balloon pump trying to save his life. This guy's in big trouble because this vessel not only supplies the blood supply of the circumflex, but it also supplies the blood supply of the right coronary artery, inferior wall. And so this is actually a twofer where we're actually getting the, the territories of two vessels. And in this view, you can see they've got the wire down and uh, putting the stent in, deploying a stent, opened the vessel, and so that was very successful. So we're really happy with our results there in that patient. And uh, we saved his life, life-threatening uh, problem that he had. That he occluded exactly where we said we didn't do anything to prevent it, even though we tried. Apparently, we didn't have enough, en enough uh, things to actually change this inflammatory reaction and keep this from happening. Very sad if you can recognize it and can't prevent it. And so 100% occlusion of the dominant circumflex, 50% osteo main left, near complete occlusion of the main left due to vasospasm spasm during the procedure, 70% proximal right coronary that doesn't go anywhere, 50% diagonal off the LAD. Epinephrine, bradycardia, aspiration, thrombectomy, IVUS, circumflex stenting, ventricular fibrillation, bradycardia, PEA, sinus tachycardia, intubated, interaortic bloom. So, man, life-saving measures to the point where now he has a 35% ejection fraction and the lateral walls out. He's had some hemoptysis from pulmonary edema, gets vigorous diuresis, and goes home all this stuff, including a defibrillator vest, because his basic ejection fraction is in the 35% range. What do we do on follow-up, Who? I mean, medical therapy will continue for sure. 40 days out, we can repeat the echo to see if he has improved or if he actually three months out since he got a PCI. Uh, but we'll have to have a follow-up echo, see what his EF is. CMR, we can get to see if there's scarring or not, if there's late enhancement, but yeah. Who? How do you like the MRI? It's contracting pretty good. There's an interior wall. There's some scarring, but... And we'll move down here, and we'll look for a scar with late gadolinium enhancement. That image looks pretty good. Basically, I don't see any scar on this particular view. And actually, we looked at all views. There's a little thinning of the septum. It has nothing to do with anything. Might be a little, maybe a little scar there, maybe. That's about it. So pretty good, pretty good results on this gentleman on everything we did in terms of very limited scar, if any. No scar. A little bit back in here. Not much. That's about it. Looks pretty good. We're going to show you a CT that we got, and we're going to look at this one over here. Hang on here. And here's our image. And we're going to take a look at the LAD. Hang on.
And here's our prox. All we're interested in is proximal LED. And there's our proximal LED. You can see the uh, non-calcified plaque. You can see the little calcified plaque. You can see the main left. That's very exaggerated. You can see quite well. 50% lesion or greater. You can see the proximal LAD uh, area. We can get back over to the circumflex and show you some proximal circumflex. Proximal circumflex area, very complex, very complex main left, very complex proximal circ, and here's our stent. So all we've done is put a Band-Aid on his heart to fix this one area that had the vulnerable plaque that ruptured, and we still got all this other stuff to deal with. And now he's in rehab, and he develops chest pain. And the chest pain is jaw pain during exercise and cardiac rehab. So now what do we do, Pooh? We've got chest pain again. I mean, medical management obviously addresses statin therapy. Even if he has myalgias, we can intensify. We'll have to discuss options, cat versus cabbage, because, I mean, there's no great answer here. First, obviously, we'll do our workup, EKG, all that good stuff, see if there's something we find if he's getting frequent chest pain. But we do know he has known disease, so cabbage is an option. But most surgeons don't like doing radiation people. And anyway, Lima doesn't last very long in these cases. So actually, what we did is we thought it over, and we said it's going to be difficult to stent the main left going to be difficult to die to basically operate on him with all the fibrosis. So we decided let's find somebody. He came over from having his chest pain. He came over here to where I'm sitting right now. We got the images up. We called Henry Lieberman, who's in Emory, and we put the images up. And Henry Lieberman and his group at Emory specialized in something called hybrid surgery. And so we talked about what would be the best case scenario. And so the best case scenario that Henry Lieberman presented was to do hybrid surgery. And he said, this is somebody else, but he said, here's what we'll do. Let's take the Lima and see what it looks like. We looked at the Lima. Lima looked great. You know, despite all the radiation, the Lima looked great. Let's take down the Lima robotically with a small incision over here on the left chest. And let's take this lima and let's attach it to the distal LAD through a little window. And so that's what they did. It didn't go to the proximal LED. It really came way down here, the distal LED. And it said, once we get that, then we'll stage the next procedure where we'll stent everything. Main, left, LAD, circumflex. We'll stent all this stuff. Might even stent the right if there's some collaterals coming from the right. So that's what we did. We did a stage procedure hybrid. You know, basically two, took it down robotically, harvested, limited access, connected it to the distal LED, and then next day put a bunch of stents in and stented everything. And so stage procedure, patient did well, had a little volume overload, responded to diuresis, and came home and has been doing well since that time, which was three years ago. And so... This is just a little information to show you that the more radiation you get, the increase in major cardiac events that occur. And it's a linear relationship. And this is basically patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma have a long-term risk of cardiac disease because of the radiation. 3.2-fold increased risk of requiring bypass surgery of some sort or angioplasty of some sort, depending upon what you can get away with. Increased mortality compared to the genuine general population. There are no established guidelines, but we're going to work on some through the International Cardio-Oncology Society of North America. And so that ends our session today. Thank you so much for coming. We have reported this case, and we have a case report published. We're glad that you could come today and spend some time with us. Sorry we went over time a little bit. Any other questions from anybody? Thank you so much. So, say that again. How is he doing? Yeah. Our case. Yeah, this case is doing great. He's working full time. Uh, he's uh, doing. He did finish cardiac rehab again. And he just got started at that time, and he finished rehab again. I see him in the office all the time. He's lost about 30 pounds. He really got the message. He's uh, okay. Trim weight. Excellent. He's 
dietary discretion, no uh, myopathies from his statins, and uh, he's a happy camper, doing great. Thank you uh, for asking. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. Thank you. And that was Shirley, by the way. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Keila, Christine, Donna, Mary, Michael, Mindy, Pooja, Sandra, Sharon, Teresa, and Whitney. Glad and Melody. Glad you could come. Bye bye. See you next okay. week.